Fantastic. This, the, you were the reason why we had to move the room because uh, the, the room we had booked wasn't going wasn't to hold everyone. Welcome to the, uh, to the Saputo Dairy Care Program and the Campbell Center for uh, the Study of Animal Welfare Lex, Summer Lecture. Uh, this is uh, sponsored jointly um, and, uh, and we're very pleased to have Dr. George Stilwell here to, to talk to us today. Uh, George participated this morning in a, in a uh, thesis defense for, for Dr. Charlotte Winder and then was agreeable to, to give a talk this afternoon. Um, this talk is going to be uh, simulcast live, so everyone just knows that. Kevin Hogg at the back is, is videotaping that and for people uh, that are interested in the talk but weren't able to, uh, to attend today. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Uh, and Professor George Stilwell. He has a Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, a Master's of Science, and a PhD, and he's a diplomat in the European College for Bovine Health Management. He works in the uh, Animal Behavior Welfare Research Lab, the Center for Interdisciplinary Research in Animal Health, Veterinary Medicine, uh, at the Lisbon University in, uh, in Portugal. George was born in Lisbon, and, uh, and then he, uh, he finished his DVM degree and went into practice for, for 15 years. Um, he, uh, he worked with uh, farm animals, but also some small animal practice and, and also some wildlife. Because of his research interests, he went back to school and uh, in 2001, he, uh, he finished his PhD and he joined the faculty at, uh, at Lisbon after that. He, uh, he teaches veterinary students. He's been involved in a number of research projects in, in dairy cattle, in, in goats and some other species and uh, probably share some of that with you today. Uh, he also has a family, he, he's got five, five, five children at home and, uh, and after this he's heading back home and going on a vacation so we managed to get him here just, just, in, just in time. His title, you can read it up there, but it's Animal Welfare and Profitable Farming. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stilwell. Hello. So. I'll start by thanking the University of Guelph, the sponsors of, for, for this talk, and especially Todd for, for inviting me. Um, like Todd said, I was born in Portugal, but my, you, you must think the, the strange name. I have an English origin, uh, but I'm sorry, but I was raised and uh, went to school in Portugal, so I'm sorry if I missed some words, so uh, I hope you understand. Uh, my objective uh, with this talk is uh, to stir up some questions, some discussion. If things get a bit hard, the emergency door is here so I can <laughs> leave quickly. Uh, but uh, I'll show you some of our research, some research from other people to see if it's, if it's possible to have animal welfare and profit profitability in, um, in farms. Okay, just a word about Portugal. Portugal, if someone doesn't know where it is, it's this very small country there. But I brought this map also to show that although it was, it's small, at one time it's discovered almost two-thirds of the, or mapped, not discovered, but mapped, two-thirds of the world. So they're small, but very, <laughs> uh, very active. Um, Portugal is a small country, but full. this is a bit of publicity, of course. Uh, it's a small country, but full of very nice uh, uh, sightseeing, very nice food. So please visit us if you have the opportunity. Uh, my life as a vet, like, like Todd said, I started as a practitioner uh, north of Portugal, then for three years, then for 12 years in the center of Portugal. Now I'm at, at the University in Lisbon, and I think of retiring the Algarve in a few years. <laughs> so I've gone through all the country. So why did I go back to school? Um, because when I was a practitioner, there were a lot of questions being raised. And I thought, well, I, I need to know answers for this. It's not just treat the animal, I should know why. And, uh, and it was at this time that welfare became one of my concerns, exactly because I thought as a practitioner 
that the welfare of the animal would mean the welfare of the, pro the producer. And so I could uh, uh, try to, 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 to help the producer by helping the welfare of the animals. So this part of, the, of my life was listing questions. And then I went to, back to university. I did my PhD also with the supervision of the University of Cambridge. Dr. Uh, Donald Broom was my supervisor. And I do research now on animal health and welfare. And this is a sentence that I found a few years ago. And it really shows that uh, the research I do is very a uh, applicable, or I try to answer those, all those questions that I found when I was a practitioner. I have to say that I continue to be a practitioner because I go out with students and I do clinical work in farms, uh, and that's, that continues to be my life, I, as you can see there. So, now we'll start with a, with a talk. So, some numbers to impress before we go into welfare. This, this is production until the 60s, uh, small fa family run, small input, local uh, commerce uh, farms, um, and things were more or less like this with, at least in my country and in Europe, with a lot of animals in the same, in the same uh, farm. But things are changing, and this is uh, sentence that I found that more food will, ha will have to be produced over the next 50 years and as you can see by this graph the population is growing very very fast. So Fowl will say that we'll need, the world will need, will need to duplicate production in milk and, and meat by 2050. So this means and, the, and you can see here the increase of production in, 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 most, in some of the, the, the animal uh, products and you can see that some countries are increasing production at a level that's uh, it's, uh, incredible. So this is the picture nowadays. Um, produce more food, um, less people working in farms, so this uh, in, in 1940 uh, one farmer would feed 19 people. Nowadays, one farmer will feed 155. So less people do, doing farming. Nutrition, genetics, husbandry, everything has improved. So this is just an example. We have changed our animals. They produce more. They, they, they will give, give us, will grow faster. And so things are changing. But on the, on the other hand, there is a constant demand for reduction in food cost. Um, I remember, I don't know the exact number, but um, in 1950, uh, someone would, could buy seven eggs for the worth of one hour of, of working. Nowadays, for one hour, they can buy 100 eggs. So food has decreased a lot. And, the, and the, 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 the consumer asks for, uh, for cheaper food. So the question is, produce more at any cost, provided it's at low cost. But the consumer wants us to produce more, wants us to produce it uh, less expensive, um, but also demands for a lot of of other features like quality, safety, environmental or reduced environmental uh, impact and of course demands animal welfare. Increasingly so, perhaps I'll talk about what's happening in Europe. I'm not so sure what happens in North America but you have to remember that I come from, from Europe. So, and why is animal welfare important? Of course the first reason is ethics. Society is changing. Society is looking at sentient animals differently. So they think that we have a, an obligation for these animals and we should treat them be better. But of course there is other reasons for protecting welfare and I have here the ones that are 
related to economics. And the, the, so the objective, the aim of this talk would be to show that it is possible to protect animal welfare and survive in the, in the uh, animal production uh, community. In 2007, there was a, a big um, survey done to, to European consumers. And you, as you can see, it varies a lot between countries. But overall, it, it shows that the that, that, uh, consumer is looking at animal welfare when they, when they buy uh, animal products. This is another, another survey that also shows and there, there was a big change between the two surveys, that uh, they, um, they, what, what they want from, from farms and from, from the industry is that animals are raised in a natural environment as possible, and companies that support animal welfare uh, causes uh, and organizations. But on the other hand, this, these are images, and the internet is dangerous because of this. These are images that go, and that's for the, uh, city born and never go out of, of, of the cities, they look at these images and they think this is animal production. And so we have to be very careful in the way we present our, our animals, the way we treat our animals, because as I can, I don't know if this expression exists in English, but the, the, the farmer can be shooting his own foot by not protecting animal welfare. He can ruin his job by, by uh, trying to, to row against the, <laughs> the current. You can see some, there is half lies or real lies being passed on. I, I, I know of, of some, of some uh, organizations that, that say that artificial insemination is very painful for cows. We know it's not, but that's the image that that's, uh, goes through. And this is the idea that uh, a cow the baby being taken, out, taken from the, the, the mother is something awful that happens every day. So the, today, during the presentation of, of, of during the defense, Charlotte's defense, we were talking about agriculture and industry. What is agriculture, what is industry? And this is uh, exactly what, what this survey also says, that consumers trust farmers, but they don't think that Animal products are produced by farmers nowadays. They're produced by industry. And that's uh, also a thing to, to take in mind. So the, the consumer, going back to, to the survey, the consumer knows that they, that they have a, a power to change things. You can see here, do, do you believe that buying uh, animal welfare friendly products could have a positive impact and you see that a lot of people think that they, they can have an impact. So the consumer has a, the power and he knows it. So of course even if you don't agree with some of the, the, the welfare rules you have to see that you have to keep the customer satisfied and you have to so th of course ethic Ethic uh, objective is the main thing, but this is just to show that you, you have to, to change with, with, with the, those that are going to buy your, your product. So in, in the EU, what happens with animal welfare? The first thing when animal welfare began to start up things, the farmer was completely revolted by the idea because animal welfare was presented by some extreme organizations that would more or less ruin farming. So the idea would be that if you can't have animals, you can't, animals have to be free. So at first time, I remember going to, as a practitioner, going to, to farms and talk about welfare and just by hearing the word, whoa, go away. I don't want to hear that word. But things are changing and acceptance is increasing because the true meaning is becoming clearer. Instead of leaving the word for these organizations, science has brought the word welfare into science. So we can work now in welfare and show that there is, uh, uh, that, it, that it is important. Um, those that did not accept and did not change to keep up with the welfare rules, mo bit by bits are being eliminated because they can't, can sell the, the, their products, and uh, farmers began to, 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 
to uh, understand that by improving welfare, their own satisfa satisfaction working with animals increased. So they, they accept more. So a new method is being diffused. Animal welfare can increase animal profitability. And so you, the farmers shouldn't be afraid of the word, of the concept of uh, animal welfare. Animal welfare is a multi-domain. It's not easy to, 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 to define. I could bring here 10 slides defining by different authors the, the, the finding, trying to define welfare, it's not easy. But usually, it, in 1966, uh, the Bramble report suggested the five freedoms, and nowadays things more or less go around those concepts of, of freedom from, from uh, um, hunger, freedom from stress, freedom from pain, etc. So, the next slides, I will try to see how these five freedoms, by complying with these five freedoms, we can increase farm profitability. The first, freedom from, from hunger. Uh, I brought this photograph because this is a photograph of a, 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 a practitioner that asked for our help because these animals were, as you can see, very thin, hyperproteinemia, very... Uh, this was a, a, a winter where there was no rain during autumn, so the, the pastures were very, very poor. And this was an organic um, farm. So he, had, he was having lots of difficulties to try and supplement these animals without losing its, uh, his organic uh, uh, status. And so uh, animals were, the welfare of the animals were, of course, not and not uh, uh, comply. But this, this is an extreme. You can say, of course, nobody will leave the, the cows to die. Um, and of course, the, the, this welfare issue is usually or generally um, accepted by farmers. But uh, what I bring is that malnutri uh, malnutrition is not only in quantity. So it could be quality, mycotoxins, it's a, a problem that we, we, we have. Not, fortunately, not all silages look like this, but <laughs> there are some that, uh, that have problems. So you, you'll get mycotoxin. It's just an example. And this is a, a, an interesting result or study. Uh, it's more a review that uh, we, we now accept TMR as part of dairy production and feedlot animals. And so these uh, researchers came up and say, perhaps by giving the homogeneous food to all cows or to all animals, we're affecting their, their, their welfare. Uh, so by doing, working with the average, we can leave, we can be overfeeding some animals and underfeeding others. So the TMR is being at least questioned by, by some researchers. And one of the, the works, the, the studies that, that came in, in this review is this one by, by, uh, with feedlot animals in which they put for, for, the, for the feedlot animals TMR or the same feedstuff but free choice. And then they looked at the different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, features and they came up with the, the last, the, the, kilo, the cost per kilogram of grain and found that the, these animals, by eating more fiber or more energy or more protein, by choosing their own feeding, uh, were more profitable. So it's interesting, this, this idea that the, the animals can choose and some animals will, will, will uh, look for, for what is better for them. Uh, for, for the same with, with pasture, of course, if you put animals 100% in pasture, you wouldn't be able to get the, the productions you get with, with the TMR in, in intensive uh, uh, keeping. But uh, there are some studies that show that if you have, and if it's possible in your situation to have at least the possibility of animals using pasture, that that will increase production and will be, these animals will be more profitable. Um, and also, lameness will decrease and other, other welfare and also economical uh, uh, aspects will, will be better. 
Uh, this is, I have to go here. This is uh, an image that some of you, or I'm sure all of you have seen, this kind of behavior. So, and the question is, why do animals do this? Um, it's interesting, it, it could be just because they're keeping <laughs> entertained. Could be because they need to move their mouth and we're giving them food that they don't have to ruminate so much and so their spare time which they have to, to do something. Um, it's interesting, there's some work being done with this and th that shows that uh, heifers bought from, from pasture and then put in different feeds and the ones that are put with very short s straw or fiber do have this behavior and the ones that are fed with long straw do not show this behavior. So it could be one, one of the, uh, the answers. Um, there are studies that show that, uh, that uh, oral manipulation of, of, uh, of, of the feed, so having longer straw, will um, increase oxytocin uh, uh, production and low cortisol levels, so will benefit welfare, but eventually also production. So there are many, many ways of, of seeing this. This is another, another study. I had a big problem in, in one farm with this, the self-sucking. I don't know if you have, I know that you now work with a lot of goats uh, and if, the, if it is a, a problem. But the self-sucking was a big problem in this, in this farm. And you m might notice that what they're wearing here. This was what the farmer uh, just to go into, there was at the same time I had this problem, this, this, uh, this uh, I read this paper and it shows that self-sucking was a problem in some farms, this, this was in Spain, and when they increased the fiber, the availability of fiber or long fiber, it uh, reduced or was eliminated. Um, you can see here, th these are Murciana breed, Murciana coming from Spain, they have a very very um, rich milk. They're not, they don't produce as much as salmon, but they, they have a very rich milk. So people bring them in to, to, to increase the fat and protein uh, concentration of the milk. And the, the, this farmer bought these, these goats and they were all doing self-sucking. And so he invented this, not with my authorization, but he invented this system and they couldn't turn the, the, the neck, so they couldn't self-suck. Um, but the interesting thing is that he didn't have in sun and goats this behavior and when these came in, some sun and goats started doing it. So they looked and said, well, perhaps that's good, let's try it. <laughs> and some, some started doing it. Okay, but uh, this was a, a way of trying to reduce it, not, not very f animal friendly not very nice. This picture in the internet for consumers, of course, would have a tremendous impact. So it's uh, not, not good to have. And, uh, we, and this, this is what happens when they try to refrain the, the self-sucking. They would start looking for other things to, to, to chew. They couldn't get their, their teeth, so they started chewing on, on, the, on, the, on the structures. So uh, we did an experiment. We, we looked before they start putting in those, uh, those iron uh, things, looking at uh, how many goats did the self-sucking. And after they start uh, doing the, the, repre the repression of, the, of that behavior, the, um, the other strange abnormal habits like chewing on, 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 the, on the trough and all that, increased a lot. Okay, I'll go. This is show, this is by, by Canadian also it's a team looking at, uh, at uh, feeding. But uh, just to continue with, uh, with more or less the same subject, I work with a, with a, a farm that's now starting doing uh, the cross, pro cross. I don't know if you, you have it here, the crossing of the three breeds. There were, the, the breeds I work with are Montbelliard, that are the back, no, Montbelliard, uh, the, the middle, Holstein and uh, Swedish Red. 
and they do this crossbreeding uh, altogether. And what happened with this, with this uh, farm is that uh, cross-sucking increased a lot. He didn't have any problem with cross-sucking. When he started this, there was a big problem. And what are the dangers of cross-sucking? Of course, they, they start as calves sucking the, the umbilicus, and so infections will, will increase. They start sucking the other of even small calves. They continue this through life. Um, and then there are more mastitis when the, when the heifers calve the first time. Usually they have one, one quarter that uh, uh, has a mastitis and, uh, and you, you, it's no, 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 uh, you can't save that, that quarter usually, you have to dry it. So the, the, the first thing w would, was to put this, these things on their nose. Doesn't work very well. It's not very nice. Once again, it's a way of just, uh, think, uh, just uh, uh, pretending you're, you're solving the case. So we did a study and we, we filmed for, for, for three days the animals in, inside the, 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 the pen or two, two pens in, in, each, uh, in this farm and we had two cameras looking at different areas. Here we put some sham teats, so there were teats to put in, in on the wall so that see, see if the, 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 the calves prefer to go there and instead of going to the other animals would, would uh, use those, but uh, as you would see, it, it's not. Uh, these, this, uh, this is shocking. It's not, of course, I don't do it, but these, these are uh, intervention done by, I don't know who invented this, but they cut their, under the tongue, they sew it, and so the, the, the calf can't roll the, the tongue to, to suck. And so they stop doing the, the cross sucking. It's, uh, it's stupid, but it shows that uh, sometimes the, the, the welfare of, of animals are, are affected. We, we try to solve the, the, the problem by doing <laughs> an even worse problem. So the, our studies, by looking at those, uh, those images for three days, continuous uh, filming, then my students uh, didn't sleep for three days, so we sat on <laughs> going back and forth with the video, looking at all the behaviors. And we came uh, across some, we then uh, had uh, someone from social uh, uh, science that uh, came with, a, with a, uh, um, a program that would analyze relationship between uh, people and use that, that, uh, that uh, uh, software. And we had this, we came up with the, the, the two groups. And the, the, um, the thicker the arrow is, it shows more relations between those two animals, more, cro more cross sucking between those animals. So you can see here that there are animals that practically don't don't have any connection with other, and some very popular animals that are uh, sucked and suck others. So it's interesting to show that there are individual uh, um, uh, features of these animals. In the, the number in the middle shows the, the number of times this animal was seen doing cross-sucking. So you can see here this one with 33, that one with 26. So some animals are very very popular. And one thing that this is anecdotal because I, I didn't uh, prove it, but by working this farm, it shows that, that uh, two animals that are together and do the cross sucking will continue doing it through when they go into heifers or not. So they're very friendly. So one way the farmers started doing it was separating these, these uh, friends. <laughs> It was not, not very nice, but it, it works because they don't start doing the cross-sucking with other animals. They learn to do between themselves and then they continue as, as friends from, from the, then on. Okay, so these are pictures taken from the video, uh, before the video so that we could identify the animals by, in the filming. Fortunately, they were all crossbred and so different colors, different shapes. <laughs> so it was fairly easy to the, the detect them. And we, we got some, some information. Of course, we didn't get the solution, but we got some information that uh, helped us to, to, to be nearer to the solution. 
Okay, thirst is also a problem. Uh, of course, once again, nobody will have a profitable farm if their animals are thirsty or permanently thirsty. Uh, but I usually bring the, this example and I say the, the problem with downer and sick cows. People sometimes forget that these animals drink 100 liters or 80 liters and they bring a bucket in the morning with uh, 10, 15 liters and a bucket in the afternoon and these animals are dehydrated because they don't have enough. Uh, and so it's uh, important to, to, to and, the, and the recovery of some of these animals can be dependent on on, on, the, the, on the management while they're down. Health, uh, of course, health and welfare are interconnected. Animal, uh, a sick animal will not produce, but some, some of these uh, uh, correlation goes further on into even the, the quality of meat. And there are a lot of work that shows that animals that are treated once or twice or three times for, for respiratory disease will have worse quality uh, uh, meat and will we'll produce less. Which, which the, the thing when we have a lot of uh, problems is, in this case, respiratory disease. I did a lot of research with respiratory disease, looking for antibiotics and new vaccines. But perhaps the, uh, one way would be increase the welfare. Increase the, 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 the genetics, the, the resistance to stress, for example, that's been proven to be uh, possible. Uh, and that will mean perhaps a, a population re more resistant to, 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 uh, to respiratory disease. Um, I know, for example, in, in the Netherlands and in Denmark, the, the government says you, this whole pig production, you have I think two years to reduce 30% of the of the antibiotics that you use in in uh, in farming, and they say that that's impossible. No, we won't be able. No, 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 that's impossible. And after three years, they had reduced and uh, nothing else, nothing increased, nothing mortality or disease incidence increased. So it's a way of looking for other ways of improving uh, the, the immunity uh, by reducing, uh, reducing density, we were talking about that, by increasing just one or two animals, you can increase 10 times the, the, the mobility. So just by reducing uh, uh, density, sometimes you solve some of these problems. And so antibiotic use now in Europe is a big issue. We are expecting for at any time for the government to start taking some of our drugs from, from, veterinary, from animal production, uh, like quinolones, uh, we were talking yesterday, and, uh, and other fourth generation uh, cephalosporins and all that. And you can see here that we have some countries that are terrible in using a lot, a lot, a lot of antibiotics. And this means, if you put on top of that the resistance to, to, to antibiotics, you'll see that it's almost the same order that you have in the use. So, the more you use, the more resistance you'll have. That's completely proven. Pain and suffering. I took my slides from dehorning because I didn't have enough time, and St. Charlotte did a, such a good job this morning <laughs> with her presentation that it was, I have nothing else to say. Um, but this is also an image from the internet from one of these organizations. And of course, if you don't know what's happening, you look at this and it's, it's awful, yeah? you, you say, well, <laughs> if this is what happens to cows, uh, I'm not drinking any milk. Uh, and we know what's happening, we know it's a carving, we know that it's perhaps just a picture at the moment that, that got this, this uh, face, and, uh, but, but th these are the images that go, that go through. Oh, I have some, some, just to remind what pain is, uh, very, very quickly, of course, all of you know it, but uh, it's, I think it's uh, good to, to remind uh, the idea of, uh, of having a, um, a very quick um, conduction to, to the brain by, by the A delta fibers and then the C fibers that bring in the, the dull pains and, and continue. So this, this is what happens when there's a, a, a lesion or, some, or surgery or whatever, but this is fairly easy to control. 
This is what we vets do when we do surgery. So we, we block, we, we give analgesics. Okay, that's, that's okay. The problem is when things continue uh, and then the even pain being brought by a better uh, fibers, that, that's the touch fibers, and so everything a cow or a calf does will, will cause pain. And then there's a, also what's called inflammatory soup. So after this first pain, if we don't treat it, we'll have the inflammatory soup, and these are the fibers, they're called silent, fiber, silent fibers, will start also sending information to the brain. And also what happens is the threshold for the C fibers to, to trigger will, will be much reduced. So everything a cow does will hurt. And this is important to show, for example, to farmers, because this will lead, this, this uh, silent fibers and the C, C fibers will lead for secondary hyperalgesia. And so when cows go into the milking pile with the mastitis in one quarter, and the farmer says, okay, that quarter must hurt, but he doesn't know that the other three perhaps also hurt. Because this, all these nerve fibers are ready to, to, to fire. And so when he's starting to wash or, or put the, the teeth cups on the other three that are not diseased, and the cow knocks the, the, the fiber, he, he, must under, he has to understand what's happening so that he can at least try to, to, to uh, resolve the, the problem. Okay, and then we, we have these animals, of course, in, in which there is continuous C fiber triggering and these animals are in constant pain. These animals are, don't have the periphery hyperalgesy, but they have central hyperalgesy. There are many mechanisms. I could go through them all, but that's not what we're here for. But this wind up, it's a word that was brought by many years ago. This wind up that brings that the, the animal is in constant pain. Of course, you look at this animal, this animal will never produce milk, will never grow, will never show heat, will be infertile. Okay, so pain is important, it has many effects. Uh, and uh, you can see the pain, for example, castrations. Castration is done mostly without analgesia and anesthesia. In Europe, it's forbidden, forbidden, forbidden. you have to do, uh, it's a surgical procedure, it has to be done by a vet with anesthesia and analgesia. Now you can ask me, but is that what happens? Okay, but at least the, the rule is there. And you can see that profitability is there because you, you can see that uh, the, the, uh, the average daily gain with animals that are castrated is much reduced compared with, with, uh, with, uh, with other animals. This is a, a study that I did at the beginning of my PhD and it shows that uh, uh, this image is to show that uh, the animals that did not get an analgesic after, after being castrated didn't go to the feed trough when food was brought, brought in. And so it shows that they're not feeding well, they're not growing. Uh, is age an, imp uh, an important uh, feature of uh, castration? Yes, you, you can see here that the weight uh, uh, loss, this is weight loss, is much less when you do the castration early. So improve welfare and you'll get more money, at least in these. Dehorning, I said I wouldn't bring dehorning, but I forgot about this. Dehorning, what's happening now in Portugal? This is what, what, um, the, the problems that we have with, with some of the breeds with very long horns. You can see when we bring them in for blood sampling or whatever, and we get them in, you get all these, this is a hernia, uh, we get broken horns, some, some cows, older cows will, will have this problem, and when they dehorn, you can see how many cows you can put around the feed trough. If all these cows had horns, it would be impossible. We would have their five or six, and not all these ones, because they would be constantly knocking the other ones over. Uh, this is, this is the breed, uh, looks very nice. These cows belong to my sister, she has 400 of these and they 
fantastic. And this is what they now look. First, the farmers thought, oh, these are not <laughs> the same cow, but they, they are. Uh, and uh, so people started, to, the farmers, beef farmers started to, to look at these uh, farms where the, the, this budding was, was done. And they thought, well, good idea. Yeah, I'm going to do that. But what happened is they started doing this. They started dehorning the adult cow. And this was a welfare problem. We've been doing meetings all over the, the, the southern, country, southern country to show that this can't be done. You have, or at least if you have to do it to one or two, it has to be a vet with a very good uh, anesthesia. And so we, there are a lot of problems, of course, of these animals, not only the pain of doing it, but of, of the, the other. And this is to show this uh, these workshops that we do with farmers, and this is just one of the films in uh, which we start teaching them to do, do the dehorning when they're small. Few, few weeks uh, and, and, and you can do it, and like Charlotte showed today, and this, this is uh, another proof, if the, if the anesthesia is well done, you're, you're, you're okay. And it's not, not expensive. The other thing about I didn't put here the author of, the, the, of this uh, paper, but the other thing about doing anesthesia and analgesia for dehorning uh, or disbudding is that the, 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 uh, the stock person is more, it's, it uh, has been shown, more attentive to other problems. If, if he's struggling with the animal, causing pain, actively causing pain, it's self-defense to forget about other, other responsibilities of, in, the, in the welfare of those animals. And so usually it's, uh, it's, they will become a bit more, how would you say, hardened, uh, I don't know, they, they're not so sensitive. So it's a way of uh, also improving the, the efficiency and the, 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 the um, uh, concern of the stock person by telling him to do this. It will it will show in the other ways in, in which he, he, he uh, addresses the animals. Uh, pain, pain after carving, this is a, a, a work done by, by a student from Cambridge that came to stay in Portugal for a few days, and we, are in, we gave analgesia, caprofen after carving. Not difficult carving, and no difference in the cow uh, production, but in the heifer production, there was a statistical difference in production. Um, why is this? Because it was one of the behaviors that we found different from, from the two groups, is that the, the ones that got caprofen went to the feed trough sooner and were there longer. So the thing is, perhaps, we didn't get to, to the answer, they start eating better when they, when they after carving, and they have less displacement, less ketosis, less whatever. This had the one <laughs> that you could say that is uh, the, the other part of the coin. And it's that these animals that got the, the analgesia uh, were uh, pregnant later. So perhaps because they produced more milk and the resources were shifted to milk production and not to reproduction. I don't know. But when presenting this data to farmers, of course, you'll say, oh, well, the cow is, uh, is not uh, pregnant uh, when she should be, but then you, you can ask her uh, uh, how to, to how, uh, if it's still profitable. Um, lameness, of course, lameness is a very important welfare issue. It's the one, number one, at least in our dairy farms, number one, because of the prevalence and because of the pain caused. Uh, and it's expensive. You can see here that uh, this, the, this uh, uh, paper is now more than 10 years um, old, but, uh, but uh, the, the figures are very similar. And so it's, uh, each case of lameness will have an impact on, 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 the, the, on production. And even on quality of milk. This is a, 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 a project that I did with a, with a student. He went into a farm, 800 cow farm, and looked at uh, the records of uh, hoof trimming, 
with uh, several lesions, uh, soul ulcers, uh, white line disease, all those, uh, and look then at uh, the cell count. And you put it all together into a huge Excel file and then did the, the analysis and found that uh, the, by having a, a, a problem, a lameness problem, would affect somatic cell counts until seven months after being treated. So it's not just something that's, that affects the cow at that moment and you treat it and next, next day the cow is okay. It may have some pain going on for a long time after being treated. The influence of uh, lameness on, on reproduction is well known. Just brought some, some examples that uh, uh, days, in, days to first insemination, all those, the enormous difference between those that are normal and those that are lame. This is also a study, it's not published, but I did in a, in a, in a dairy farm, which I gave after cows went into the, the chute to treat soul ulcers, simple soul ulcers, not infected or complicated. Uh, and some get, were, were given caprofen, and the others were normally, like every day, just trim and, and, and let them go. And we went uh, to look at the milking before and after going to the shoot, and the ones that were, were given caprofen, in average, increased 10% of milk in the three days afterwards. And the ones that were not given caprofen decreased 14% of their production. So that means that for some days there is still some pain, the animal will be lying down more, will eat less. <coughs> it's a nice one. This is a, a project, it's a, I think it's a very nice project because I al already have some results, but now I have a student who will start in September uh, increasing the numbers, in which I'm, we're using a gel invented by some Australians to do uh, pain management in sheep that are being done. I, I never remember the name of this intervention, which they cut the, the skin from the, from the merino uh, muesli. muesli yeah. So they use it for that. And I, I was with, with these Australians. I said, well, I have a better use for, the, for that gel, for soul ulcers. Because when I treat soul ulcers and I start trimming, it hurts. Of course it hurts. We can block. But should we block every cow that we do the trimming? It takes a long time. You will never convince a farmer to block every cow. And, and he can't do it. He would have to have a vet there. So we're, we're starting putting, when we, when we get to the sole ulcer, so there's a, a wound, it's open. It's not put on top of horn, of course. There's a, a wound. And we're looking at the, the, the algometer results before and after putting the gel on and the reaction of the animal while we're trimming. And the preliminary results are very good. The reaction of these animals are completely. The one you can trim, it's like taking, going to the, to the, the dentist and drilling without <laughs> anesthesia or with anesthesia. And you put it there and you work. And it works fantastic. And so it would be a good solution because a farmer could use it. It uh, doesn't have to be a vet. Um, so we, we're, we need to continue a, a bit of this study. This is a study also very interesting in which they, they put some boots on heifers after calving and show that for the, for this, this for, from Michigan State University, difference in milk production in the ones that, were, that had boots it shows that the anim th these were not lame, visibly lame, clinically lame, but it shows that after calving, and these perhaps were heifers brought from past, or after calving there is some discomfort, even if it's not real pain, some discomfort. I, I like this uh, work, but uh, uh, it's not easy to replicate this, this kind of put, put boots in on, on cows. Dairy goats, a problem I've been talking to, the, to Kelly, I think that it was last night or Tuesday night, the big problem with the deformation and the overgrowth of, of, uh, of uh, these, these animals. Uh, farmers uh, don't have time. This is a farm with 2,000 goats. They don't have time to go through them all. They do the, the ones that are worse. And so the, the question is, do the, are they lame because it's a mechanical problem, like having a shoe that's uh, crooked and you walk like that, or is it because it hurts? It's a, this was a question, and we, we did a, um, 
uh, study with, with the goats in which we do, did thermography to, to see if there was information and then we did trimming and repeated to the... So we, we had the animal standing for five minutes and then one minute walking up and down, up and down, up and down and then did the photograph again to see if there was an increase in temperature because of the inflammation of walk, walking and after trimming. So there was in, in the first the first uh, day of the study, there was a difference between those that were deformed and those that were not deformed. So it shows that there is some inflammation there. After trimming, don't look at the temperature were different because the environmental temperature was different. So you have to compare only these two and these two. You can't compare them both. Um, we, we didn't show any difference except for those that were very, very deformed. So chronic cases that with trimming, you couldn't get them back to to normal. This, this is uh, such a prevalent problem and such a welfare issue, important welfare issue, that we did some, we are now doing some work and cutting and you can see what happens here in the corium of the, of, the, of the hoof. There's a bleeding, so there is a problem in going inside. And now we're doing CAT scans of these, of these uh, uh, of these uh, legs, uh, you, you, you have so. Why did we kill the, cat, uh, the the goat? Because of this, Th these are goats that died for other reasons, pregnancy, toxemia, or whatever. So we didn't kill the the goats because of the of the hoofs. Um, are there hidden causes of pain? I don't know if you've ever seen these animals with a limb with a rib. Uh, um, it's not swollen because it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's bone, and these this was also a, a work that a student did, and he found two percent prevalence of this kind of lesions. But we usually don't see it, even in physical examination. We look at the temperature and the and the, and the, the head and this and that, but we don't look there. And so these are this is um, some. Uh, picture from uh, Roger Blowy and you can see the uh, animal, you can see that there is a fracture in these eight or ninth uh, uh, inter um, chondrocostal uh, joint um, and nobody really knows why it happens but one of the, the theory is that uh, cows, especially cows with chronic lame, fall down. They don't really die, uh, lie softly but they go down and then go down and hit their ribs on their hind hoof and this is the theory we, we did an analysis and found that these factors were correlated with the with, with the, 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 the rib fracture and one of them was hoof trimming uh, was only done in those farms when the, the animal was very lame euthanasia we'll go through it just I had, but the, I think the, the time is uh, running. Yeah? Uh, a lot of heat stress. Heat stress is a, an economical problem. It's a welfare. It's an economical problem. Uh, overstocking, commingling, uh, small animals with large animals. This is a study also we did, and the incidence of, of uh, uh, bovine respiratory disease was much higher in the lighter and younger animals. So it shows that the stress of being with with the other animals is important. Um, this is a study showing that uh, giving antibiotics or leaving the animals to rest perhaps will have the same results or even better with, with having the animals to, to rest after being transported. Uh, these are cortisol um, after, for, for veal calves brought after, um, um, after transportation, saliva and, and plasma cortisol, and you can see that they're, they're compared with, after being eight days in the farm, they had higher, statistically significant higher cortisol. And the ones that had higher cortisols, don't, don't look at this because these are only two animals, so it's statistically it's not significant but the ones that uh, were treated for BRD for bovine respiratory disease more animals that had higher cortisol were treated during the, the time they were in the in the farm okay just going uh, stress during pregnancy this is a I was a part of a, a big European study called AWIN AWIN animal 
welfare indicators. And I, I worked in, in Portugal with the goats. Um, uh, the, the Scottish team worked with um, sheep and the and Norway team also worked with, uh, with goats. And they showed that the stress during pregnancy could affect the, 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 the animals, the young kids after they, they were born. This is just an example uh, of uh, the, the, the speed they learn to different behaviors. Being this in, in red is the, the one that were, had aversive treatment during pregnancy. Aversive treatment was not very bad, it was just clapping hands and shouting around the, the goat. But you could see that this affects the kid when he is born. So it's uh, interesting. Uh, fear is very important. Just uh, this, this is a very nice study by uh, Mateus uh, from Brazil. He was asked by a big uh, retailist called Carrefour to look at the farms because a lot of animals were coming into slaughter and a lot of uh, um, meat was being thrown away because of uh, uh, different kind of trauma. And he went and did a, a, a training course in all these farms. And you can see here the reduction of, uh, of uh, meat that was uh, thrown away in the slaughterhouse just by training the, 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 the people that work in the farm. So just by knowing how to take them and to put them inside and all that. So the fear from humans is very, very important. Um, human ham animal relationship also a lot of uh, studies showing that uh, they cows by being afraid of the, of the, the of the sock person will produce less less milk uh, i don't know if you do you know what's what's happening here you have these cows here <laughs> and these cows usually are much more afraid of humans than the ones that, that they need. So this, this is a terrible thing. It's one of the indicators that we use for animal welfare assessment. Uh, fear from ke keepers. I'm sorry for going very fast, but it's just to show some, some, uh, some other studies that are a bit more interesting. This is the one that uh, looked at a, a control pen with a completely very barren for, for fattening lambs. And the one was very simple uh, enrichment. And then they looked at different uh, fe features of the, the meat. And you, you see here, not, not only quick adaptation to new environment, but also better carcass and heavier carcasses. So just by having some, something for the lamb to, to jump and to, to climb was good. So better welfare, better profit profitability. This is an organic uh, 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 organic um, farm and you have much those uh, enormous uh, uh, claws you don't usually have them in these in these farms and this is also an uh, environmental enrichment <laughs> it, it's uh, and finally it's just to say we were saying that welfare is important but now how can we know if the welfare is good in, at the farm? And so just very quickly show you the, the, uh, the results of our uh, study, the AWIN project in Wilts, which we pr produced a welfare assessment protocol. And we looked at different indicators, the called animal-based indicators. So looking at lameness, looking at uh, body conditioning, uh, looking at the claw and uh, overgrown claws and the 24 other indicators. This is the, the protocol that, that we go through. Um, just to, to and, and by doing this protocol, it's, it's good for the farmer because we sometimes detect subclinical problems that are there and affect the production. And by applying the, the protocol, we can say, well, look at this and look at that. So it's not, not something to, to punish the, the farmer or look for problems. The, the way we think of presenting the results to the farm is not, this is the problem. Usually what we say is, these are very good in your farm. And usually they ask, okay, good, I'm, I'm good at that. What's, what's the, oh, and you have this one that you could solve. And usually they, they, they do it much better than just listing the problems, starting by listing, listing the problems. Um, we're now applying the protocol 
uh, that is um, adapted from the welfare quality. That uh, welfare quality project was a, a EU project uh, uh, many years ago that uh, did uh, the same kind of protocol assessment for dairy cows. And uh, I adapted the, the protocol for these cows in the Azores. Azores are a small island, halfway between here and, <laughs> and Portugal. Um, and they, and they, they started a, a new milk product because it's very difficult for them to sell because the milk, to, to send the milk to the continent by ship, it increases. A, so they think, well, how can we sell our milk better? And one way is 100% of the days in, in pasture because the, the, the climate is fantastic. There's always grass, green grass. It's more or less like New Zealand. And uh, so they started, and this is what the, the milk is called, milk from happy cows. And so they are now selling milk from happy cows, and they are increasing. And so this is uh, the, 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 um, um, the flux of the, the indicators collection in pasture then uh, at the milking parlor. And we complete the, 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 the survey, and then we have green, yellow, or red lights for different indicators. If a, if a farmer has one red light, he's out of the program. If he has two yellow lights, or above two yellow lights, he's also out of the program. If he has two yellow lights, he has a, a time to uh, solve those, those problems. Um, we have now 33, 35 farms that are part, and the good thing about it is that they are, of course, the ones that comply have uh, um, a, 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 pri a, a premium, a premium for, for milk, and so they're, they're happy also, like the cows. And this is what happens. This is the, this, the, the, in this farm, the, the, the calf pen, and of course this was a red light. And so he couldn't be in the program with that. And he invested, and you can see the difference in, in light, the difference, the, one of our one of the things that he can't give milk in a bucket, he has to give it by teats. Or, and so you, you see the difference. He invested because it was, he, he could see that there was uh, uh, an improvement also for his uh, welfare. And so the, 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 this program won a, a, an award now by Compassion in Wool Farming. And so now in the, in the package uh, they can put uh, this award. So there is also a commercial benefit, but that's, that's not really a problem. Uh, the welfare assessment, we're doing it also with the chickens, and what we found is that we can use indicators in the, sorry, we can use indicators in the slaughterhouse to know what is the welfare at the farm. So we don't have to go to the farm and we can be there and looking at different indicators like hawk burns and all that and uh, looking at uh, the and then going to the farm when this is very bad we go to the farm to see what's what's the problem. Uh, this is a uh, uh, Katerina Krug, she's, she's now in Montreal I think, I think in Montreal, no? Um, she's a student and she's here now st studying. And she did the same, the welfare assessment in, in 24 farms in, in Portugal. Then went to the national data and look, how can I detect these farms by the national data? Is there something that will show me so that I can go to, to, only to the farms that have potentially a problem? And so she came up with this and it's also important. So there's a long road ahead. I'll just, the, the problem with welfare is also that welfare is not the same everywhere. And so to have some rules that apply in China or in Portugal or in Australia or here in Canada, it's not easy. Uh, the, the, the Europeans say that uh, um, 9 out of 10 believe that the, the, that the EU should uh, lead the way into animal welfare. That's the, and, the, and that the, the, the farmers, um, there should be some control over the, the products imported because of animal welfare issues. And so there we have nowadays a lot of certification like these. Some, some are science-based, some are a bit, bit too much uh, uh, 
from the heart and not from the head and say it's not they don't work very much um, but that this this reflect on day-to-day -day decisions usually the the consumer says yes yes i'm prepared to pay a lot more if it's a well and then when they go into the supermarket hmm, i'm not sure if they so they answer for their conscience and not to really for, for what they and this is what, how, how they usually answer yes certainly i would pay more yes probably but is this really what happens that that's the problem so in conclusion and if you're still awake <laughs> um, i think that the welfare is should be seen as also part of animal production and not as an enemy but as a part so Without the, the legs, the bicycle won't go forward. Without the hands, the bicycle won't go forward. We have to have them together to, 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 get, uh, to survive and, uh, and improve our animal production. And sorry for the delay in <laughs> finishing this. Okay, thank you.